The word hope, by definition, is a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. As we get older, as we phase out of our youth into our 20s and into our 30s, hope for the future becomes something that so many people lose track of and lose sight of. But it is so important to maintain. People have hope for their children, that their children will do better than them. They have hope that their loved ones and people that they care about on a day-to-day basis will thrive, stay healthy, do well. People have hope that their personal and professional lives will continue to grow. 31-year-old Kimberly Dyer from Columbia City, Indiana had hope. She was a single mom that worked her butt off to provide for those children. She was a waitress at a small local restaurant and she also worked at a local bowling alley. However, in the fall of 2019, those same people that loved her began to notice slight, subtle changes in Kimberly. That she wasn't doing as well as she once was. And in November of that year, people began reporting that they had lost contact with Kimberly, that her children hadn't seen their mom. And from there, police began posting and putting notices out on social media and in the news media. However, what would end up coming to light of what happened to Kimberly Dwyer was more dark and sinister than anybody could ever imagine. It's been hard on all of us. Um, I think we feel worse for her kids than anything. Yeah, we begin in Columbia City, where the torture and murder of a young woman is shocking to many who knew her there. Thanks for joining us. I'm Tom Powell. Linda has the night off. Fort Wayne's NBC reporter Jeff Newmeyer spoke to a co-worker of the victim who says no one should have to have had have to endure what police say Kimberly Dyer went through. Jeremy Bentz remembers when 31-year-old Kimberly Dyer brought her children into Columbia City's bowling alley downtown where the two worked. Dyer was a waitress at Main Bowl and at the 11th Frame restaurant next door. She went missing in October, prompting a Facebook post from the Elkhart County Sheriff's Department in early November seeking tips on her whereabouts. But authorities now believe by that time she was already dead. The Elkhart County prosecutor has charged 19-year-old Mario Angulo Jr. and 20-year-old Donald Owen Jr. with murder and confinement, alleging that she was tortured inside an Elkhart home before she was killed. 24-year-old Matthew Merzinski is charged with confinement causing serious bodily injury. She was energetic and she had everything under control and everybody loved her. Beth Turner worked with Dyer at the restaurant for more than a year. Turner says Dyer in no way deserved to die in such an awful way. They're ruthless. They, they can't have a conscience at all. And, you know, they didn't realize that, you know, she's somebody's mother and she's somebody's daughter. Some of the main charging documents from the court system remain under seal, partially to protect witnesses in the case, but the Elkhart County prosecutor not holding back at all about the brutality of this crime. Prosecutor Vicki Becker maintains that Dyer was intentionally murdered and was burned, mutilated, or tortured while she was still alive. In a window at the house where she died, a picture of a gun with the message, nothing in this house is worth dying for. Written on the garage door, the words, I'll find you. A neighbor said cars and people routinely cycled in and out of the house. And knowing now details of the murder? It's kind of shocking that, yeah, they're outside my door and I have no idea somebody's going. It's, uh... Yeah, it's hard to process that. Prosecutors intend to seek life without possibility of parole against Owen and Angulo and up to 90 years in prison for Merzinski, claiming the actions of the trio under Indiana's criminal gang enhancement allow for their sentences to effectively be doubled. Jeff Newmeyer, Fort Wayne's NBC. All right, thank you, Jeff. The suspects are also charged with robbery and confinement in connection with alleged crimes committed against a Sturgis, Michigan man. Those who knew Kimberly Dyer, who was murdered in Elkhart back in 2019, and one of the men involved will spend decades behind bars. 16 News Now reporter Zach Horner joins us live in the studio. So, Zach, what reaction are you hearing from those who are close to Kimberly? Well, Lauren, I'm told despite allegations she was running with a rough crowd, she was a caring mother, a hard worker, and they're glad justice is being served for a horrendous crime. The things that we heard happened to her, uh, the things that family knows, and the condition in which she came back to her family, uh, it just seems to me that I cannot believe that it wouldn't be life without the possibility of 
It may not be life without parole, but this man, 25-year-old Matthew Merzinski, is sentenced to 60 years in prison for his role in the torture and murder of 31-year-old Kimberly Dyer. 60 years to me for a, a guy that's in his 20s, uh, you know, that's that's basically taking his life. Brzezinski took a plea agreement admitting to aiding, inducing, or causing robbery resulting in bodily injury with an enhancement for criminal gang activity and a charge of criminal confinement as well. For her to go in the way that she went is, is an absolute travesty. The details of the crime are grisly to say the least. Prosecutors say Dyer was intentionally murdered and was burned, mutilated, and tortured while she was still alive. These two men are convicted of the murder and have yet to be sentenced. Those who knew Kimberly say they are still in shock, but remember her as a good person and are glad justice is being carried out for the grisly crime. I'm glad they did their job and I'm glad somebody is paying for it so that the family could have peace. But there's really not a peace that you can have with this. This one was, this one was hard because it, it really took a, a good person uh, from the earth. Uh, Kim was a great person. And as for the men convicted of the murder, Donald Owen Jr. is scheduled to be sentenced next week, and Mario Angelo Jr. is scheduled for June 24th. Lauren, back to you. Cases out of Elkhart involving the murder of a Columbia City woman. Three Elkhart men are under arrest, charged in the October torture and death of 31-year-old Kimberly Dyer. Donald Owen and Mario Angelou are charged with murder and criminal confinement. A third man, Matthew Merzinski, is also charged with criminal confinement. Dyer was listed as a missing person back in November. Police say all three men were involved in gang activity. What's going on, you guys? Welcome back to another episode of Greenlit Gang TV. Appreciate you guys checking out the channel. Much love, much appreciation. Um, before we get into this today, I want to give a big shout out to probably my top two favorite YouTube channels, The Killer Chronicles. They are an amazing YouTube channel with a huge, huge following. I encourage any of you to go on their page right now after you're done watching this video and check out their content. They are awesome. They are what I aspire to be. Um, I watched their, they did a recent video just a couple days ago on this case and it really inspired me to make this video. I want to give credit to them right now so there's absolutely no confusion. They are an awesome channel. I watched their video a few times. They are similar in the sense that they cover gangs all around the country. They obviously have a different format. And to be honest, their format's better than mine. <laughs> they, are, they are just on a whole other level. Um, but I just want to give credit to them as I was able to get certain information about this case from them. Obviously, I did my own research. I watched my own videos on it, watched my own news clips, read my own news articles. But just want to give a big shout out to them. Um, awesome channel. Again, The Killer Chronicles. Go check them out. If you like my channel, you are going to love that channel. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the brutal murder of Kimberly Dyer. Now when I say brutal, sometimes maybe I even throw that word around a little too much. Uh, not in this case. I don't think brutal quite does it justice. Uh, I think the word grisly was the way to describe Kimberly Dyer's murder and that's more accurate. Um, and kind of surprised, you know, I... I a lot of these gangs are nationwide. The Latin Kings, who are going to be, who is the focal point of this story, um, are a nationwide gang. They're in around 40 plus states. Um, sometimes numbers are skewed on that, but I absolutely believe that to be true. So the Latin Kings, they've grown and thrived and they've gotten more and more violent, it seems like. Uh, as the years go on, you know, I read some of these stories. I've done a couple of videos on the Latin Kings over the last few months. And yeah, they are. Um, They've been around for a long time, but I feel like they often don't get mentioned a lot. But they are, they're absolutely with the business, man. They, they were formed in uh, the 1960s in Chicago. They have huge, you know, factions, Chicago, New York, but they are all over. And they have a huge presence, as I would come to learn, in the Midwest. They are part of the People's Nation, uh, along with the Vice Lords and the Black Peace Stones. They're rivals, Folk Nation, Gangster Disciples, other smaller street gangs, cliques, present in almost 40 states, like we talked about. They have a massive presence in the Midwest, like our case here in Indiana. They go off of wording like love, respect, obedience, and honor. I try not to give my opinion too much on stuff, but we read cases like this. They run drugs. They extort home invasion robberies, uh, carjacking, identity theft, murders, just uh, the gamut. So... A little bit hard when you read love, respect, obedience. It's not gonna, you know, not gonna say that leaders and other 
ranking members. You can't you can't group them all up into one, but they are absolutely a criminal organization that commits multiple crimes every single day. They don't bat an eye at committing murder, and uh, so you know I I feel like sometimes some of these street gangs they try to portray a certain image, you know, and uh, I'll get comments like ah oh, you're just telling what the media says, but at the end of the day, people get murdered over uh, you know. And non-gang members get get murdered. But this is a story um, that really hits, not hits home, because I've never experienced anybody I know have this happen to them. But, you know, we talk about addiction a lot on this channel. And um, it's so important to remember, guys, if you're in the streets, if you're using drugs, if you're running dope, it just takes one time something to go wrong, you know. Um, like I've talked about, I am not a gang member. I've never been a gang member. I'm a white guy, but I had a very horrible drug addiction for over 10 years. I was a very, very bad opiate addict. Um, and I put myself in situations and hung out with people that were gang members and that were in the streets and were committing committing violent, violent acts. And again, no judge against any, anybody, anybody who's locked up, anybody who's done time, anybody who's done violent, whatever. Um, you know, God's the only one that can judge. But my point is, I know people, and I myself was one where I was like, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not in the, I'm not in the, the gangs. I'm not running, gun in the streets. I'm in the streets as far as I'm going to go get what I need to get, or I'm hanging around certain people. But nah, I'm not, you know, I'm not actively out there looking for rivals or anything. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If the drugs don't kill you. If you don't end up in jail, there's a threat of you find yourself at the wrong place at the wrong time. I'd be in a trap house for hours, right? You might get robbed. You might get rolled up on a raid. I've been in houses where the police are circling the block. I remember driving to the dope spot and getting ran off by police. They're not even pulling you over. They're just running you out of there. They're recognizing your car and getting you out of there. I have been pulled over before and basically told, what are you doing? And, and you lie, say, oh, I'm giving somebody a ride, and they know it's just BS. Um, I had that happen. You know, um, I've been in situations where things got tense between maybe a drug transaction or, or you know, gang members. If people are, and like in this case, people are using meth, people are using shit like that and they've been up for a couple of days and they're paranoid guns knives um if you've ever been around methamphetamine users um and i have i've been around them that was not my my drug of choice but um i i would notice little things there was a guy that i knew that he liked knives you know he'd get high he'd be knives different blades different you know, it's like a tweak. It's a thing. You know, they're taking apart radios, they're taking apart car parts. I used to go to a guy's garage to pick up and he'd have three, four cars in the garage or a couple cars in the garage and tools everywhere, things torn apart, not put back together. It's just, you can just tell. And some of it's funny. Some of it's funny. God, I'm sure we all got stories of God. He used to have a guy that would literally sit in his living room and he'd take apart his TV and he'd put it back together or he'd Talk about how he was going to to wire this to that. It's like, oh my God, man, you know, just give me my stuff and let me get out of here. But the point is, like we're going to talk about this story, just be careful. And living that life, what I realized is as an opiate user, there's not a lot of old heroin addicts, you know, as a, as a recovering heroin addict, there's not a lot of old heroin addicts, right? We die. We pass away. Uh, meth, methamphetamine addicts, cocaine addicts, stuff like that. Yeah, they, they get older. But that drug is so dirty, that drug will eat you from the inside out. And if you haven't done it, don't. If you have, you know what I'm talking about. Or if you know, I guarantee you everybody listening right now has had somebody. If, if you haven't yourself been aff afflicted with drug addiction, you know somebody that has. And you know how insidious it is and how it creeps in. My addiction affected every single buddy who was in my life, from my work to my family to my girlfriends, whoever I was dating. It affected and brought everybody down. You are a ball and chain, and you are risking your life every day you go out. And people can laugh and say I'm exaggerating. I'm not. And for those of you that have been a part of that life, you know I'm not. So anyway, back to this. Kimberly Dwyer, she's beginning to basically 
and you can tell in her pictures, okay? Um, immediately, again, we've talked about this before, you can tell when somebody's abusing drugs most of the time, okay? And I could look at Kimberly Dwyer and you could just tell. Um, I've been around, and I don't want to say it the wrong way. She, like I said, everybody loved her. She was a good mom. She worked hard, but she was a meth user. And you could tell, um, again, man, it's hard to explain if you haven't done it, but you know the look. You know how girls will dress. Um, they'll wear certain things a lot. There's just a way, a look, you know, it's in the face. The face is harder. When I say harder, I just mean it's more worn. Um, you know, the way the eyebrows, the eyes are, you can just tell, you can just tell, uh, when a female is using drugs, especially a drug like meth. Um, and unfortunately you can tell in older pictures when she wasn't, or maybe not as much to when she absolutely was. It's just her movements, the eye movements. If you haven't been around it, it's kind of hard to explain, but if you have, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so kind of takes us to a guy named Tyler Saunders' house, all right? He buys a home on Orch- Old Orchard Lane in Elkhart, Indiana. Doing well. Married, kids. It's a nice house. It's like 2,500 square feet. He's doing well. Well, just like we talk about, life happens. Divorces happen. Uh, he's married. Things are good. 2019, he divorces, begins the foreclosure process, and the drug use picks up. And he starts letting people come over, right? Because you're in pain. You hurt. Your wife, uh, you know, kids, they all leave. You got to fill that hole, man. And you're going to fill it with narcotics. You're going to fill it with people that you think care about you when they don't. And basically it becomes, in a way, just a trap house, okay? It's a massive house. And dealers and users alike are coming over. Tyler Saunders, for letting him use his house, I guarantee you, is probably getting high for free. Uh, Methamphetamine is a little bit a lot more cheaper than uh, other drugs. And you can use a little bit of it and stay up for days. Um, and that's that's what's going on. And that's where Kimberly Dwyer kind of comes in. So she also uh, is, gets out of a long-term relationship and she starts dating a guy, Jose Lopez Jr., who's a street guy using drugs. Their, their common bond obviously is meth. Uh, and you know, guys, what I see from these people is people that are just broken, broken individuals uh, that made bad decisions and, you know, it just affects your mental and physical health and your mental health. It's just bad. And even reading this, you know, I just can relate to a lot of this stuff on a lot of different levels. So she begins using drugs more frequently. She ends a long-term relationship. She's with Jose Lopez Jr. Uh, and... There's people around, so we're going to put some names out there. A girl by the name of Ashley Bope, all right? Well, then, there are also the presence of Latin Kings gang members, okay? So, those Latin Kings gang members, all right? Mario Angulo Jr., all right? And a guy by the name of Matthew Merzinski, okay? There's a third one, leader by the name of Donald, and I say leader, he was kind of revered by the other Latin kings in this area. He went by the name of King Duke. Uh, you see on his social media, that's all his handles, all that. You know, he loved, you know, representing that LK on the neck, the head. Um, definitely, you know, about that life. All right. So Kimberly, and again, you know, you got to remember, Matthews, okay, tweaking, doing weird, different stuff. There's a girl that was in and out of the house by the name of Ashley Bope who had a notebook, all right? Well, Kimberly finds this notebook and these pages that had a list of names, a outline of the entire house, rooms labeled, all this stuff. looked like a wedding list, all right, when I read some of the court paperwork, Uh, but it's not. And it looks like something that the cops would need or cops would use. All right. Kimberly, and they didn't really know why, she keeps the notebook. She shows her then boyfriend, Jose Lopez Jr. Well, the Latin Kings end up finding out. Matt Merzinski and Angulo Jr., they get pissed, beyond pissed. Angulo, he blames Kimberly for his brother being locked up. Okay. They immediately force her to go down to the basement of the house. She starts screaming. She starts yelling. She's freaking out. 
And you got to remember, okay? Drug users in the house. You got gang members in the house. They grab this girl, Kimberly Dyer. They force her downstairs. And people are backing her up. People are going, it's not hers. It's not hers, okay? But it said that Angulo had already blamed, like, you could tell, I, I don't know all the ins and outs. He didn't like Kimberly Dwyer to begin with, okay? So finding this notebook in her possession, and it said after they found out that she had had the notebook, they started going through all her possessions. They didn't find anything else, okay? But it's enough. They throw her in the basement. And from there, things go from a four, five to a hundred. They begin to beat her. They shave her head. They waterboarded her. And you got to remember, it's a big house, but still, it's people are right upstairs and they can hear all this, okay? So there's another guy who was there who frequented in that house. His name's Robert Porter. He was a weed dealer who had left to re-up in Michigan and he comes back, okay? Well, he, and again, I'm like, wait, what? He just dives full in. He goes, hey, I'll help you guys out. I'll participate. I'll offer to guard her. While you guys figure out what you're going to do. And at that time, okay, so he's, yeah, I'll, I'll guard her, right? So Mario Angulo goes outside and he contacts Donald Owen. And he tells him, I can't tell you what's going on. You just need to get over here. All right? And Owen shows up with a gun. And these guys are active, man. Owen, they, they, they've done robberies. Owen shows up with a gun and ready to do a robbery because he's like, oh, you know, you can't tell me what's going on. Maybe we're about to hit a lick, okay? Well, when he walks in, he's holding a knife as well. Mrzinski stated that Porter is helping guard and we're going to take you downstairs and we're going to show you what's going on, okay? Kimberly Dyer, upset, screaming. Owen comes in wearing a bandana, all right? Well, like it talks about, he immediately realized we're killing her and uh, I don't need to cover up who I am anymore. So he takes off his bandana. So they go upstairs, discuss things. Okay, they're still beating on her, but they go upstairs. Robert Porter is still guarding Kimberly Dwyer downstairs. Well, all of a sudden they hear screaming and yelling coming from Kimberly Dwyer. They rush downstairs. She's on her stomach, with duct tape on her mouth, fat lip, Okay. She begins accusing Robert Porter of S.A. For S.A., you know, assaulting her. Well, how we talked about Robert Porter making a mistake that he was going to, oh, I'll guard her. He attempts to leave. Okay? No. No. They confront Porter. They bring him upstairs. They throw a towel over his head. And Owen begins punching Porter. And he also notices from what Mrzinski and Angulo told him that, hey, he's got jewelry on. So Owen looks down, sees rings, jewelry. And one of the rings was uh, Porter's grandfather's ring. And Owen goes, oh, I got to get paid. Takes the stuff off of him, takes the jewelry off, and they keep beating him up. They use zip ties to hands and ankles him. They throw him in a dog cage. This is no joke. Throw him in a dog cage and force him to eat dog food. He's still pleading for his life. He's pleading for his life. It's only when they, prom- they make him promise not to say anything and they record him making a full confession, okay? They then take a blowtorch and in order to take the zip ties off, they don't just cut him. They blowtorch his hands to take the first ri- set of zip ties off and they blowtorch his ankles to take the second set of zip ties off. They say, get the hell out of here. As he goes to leave, I'm sure he's running out of there, Donald Owen grabs a kitchen knife, a 12-inch kitchen knife, and stabs him. Porter's still able to get out of there, but he is badly wounded, and he flees. He leaves, okay? He's out of there. Doesn't call the police, but he leaves out of there, okay? Now, back to Kimberly Dwyer. They're beating her, just horrifically doing all all sorts of things. We don't need to talk about everything. Well, Mario Angulo, it was said that he killed her by, uh, with a broken bottle. He had stabbed her multiple times. But a pathologist said that there were three possible causes of death and there were 83 distinct wounds on Kimberly Dwyer. Donald Owen was quoted as telling the group, quote, put her to sleep. Brutal, ruthless, and, you know, these guys are making a name for themselves. So 
they got a snitch, which in the absolute, you know, gang world, gang life, street life, don't you have to be a gang member. You you have a notebook. What they think is you have a notebook with all these names in it and a drawing of the house. Um, yeah. Now, really quick. Donald Owen didn't come alone. He came with a female to the house by the name of Jennifer Kufelt. Now, after they killed Dwyer, okay, or Dyer, I'm sorry, Dyer, people in the house are not okay with this. Tyler Saunders is not okay, okay? Well, the three leave. Jennifer Kufelt, who came with Owen, she helps get rid of the body, all right? Kimberly Dyer's boyfriend, now remember, think about this, guys. These few people in the house, nobody calls the police. Everybody's terrified. And in this case, listen, I'll be honest, I don't really blame them. You just saw what they did to Porter. You just saw what they did to Dyer. Again, you know, um, I, I can't talk a lot of, uh, a lot of masa because I, I get it. Well, doesn't really matter because a few days later, Kimberly Dyer's boyfriend, right? I kind of roll my eyes when I say that. Not much of a boyfriend. Jose Lopez Jr. gets picked up on a PO violation, parole, uh, probation violation, unrelated. He flips. He turns over like a he turns over like a pot pie, like a pancake. He gives them Jennifer Kufelt's name, who is the one that came with Donald Owen. Police go and see her, confront her, and she caves. Okay, bad. These guys turn over like an apple pie. Um, you guys like my uh, references there? Anyway, she leads them. Now, this is crazy, right? She leads them about 40 miles or 40 minutes northeast of where they're at in Elkhart to a plastic drum covered by camouflage down an embankment in a forestry area by water, okay? And around that same time, Mario Angulo. These guys are young, okay? And I'm going to give you their ages in just a second. He has a surrogate mom by the name of Jerry K. Delater Foster. He came to her, broke down, freaked out, and he asked her to cover it up, which I kind of was thrown for a loop because I'm like, cover, cover what up? How do you cover, like, cover, what are you talking about? You know, because it's, it's done. They already got rid of the body. People already know you did it. Um, what are you going to cover up? That's my, oh my God, kind of a, you know, but... I can imagine your brain at that point, you're in total survival mode. You're probably numb. And what will happen, guys, is a lot of traumatic experiences, even for people that commit crimes, young people that freak out afterwards. Your brain is going to kind of play tricks on you. There's going to be things you tell yourself that make you think, hey, maybe I can get away with this. Even though if somebody like me reading this story or telling this story, you guys listening, you're going, oh, my God, you guys, you guys were doing life in prison or, or uh, death penalty before you even left the house. It's just a matter of when, not if, you're going to get caught. So she even tells police she was hoping that he would break down, apologize. The only reason he broke down is for his own well-being. She tells him, which I, I thought was kind of interesting. So because, okay, they, police first make public comments about her being missing in November, okay? She dies October 21st or 22nd. They're not really sure. I feel like it's more October 21st, but I guess if it led past midnight, you know, hard to tell. But um, she tells him, Mario Angulo, this isn't her notebook. So what I'm kind of thinking happened is, is that in the police, all this was a ruse. So the public notice that, hey, guys, we're looking for, we don't know what happened. It was all a ruse by police. They, they, they had their suspects. Or they had talked to Kufel, they had talked to Lopez, they, they, they kind of knew. But it's a ruse. Well, it worked because you see, all right, you see, <clears throat> excuse me, Ang Angulo's, Mario Angulo's surrogate mom, Jerry K. Sla uh, Delater, she tells police, yeah, he's freaking out, but not for the reasons you think, not because he feels bad, but for his own well-being. And apparently when she told him that was not Kimberly Dyer's notebook, Mario Angulo, quote, coldly and callously said, quote, she won't be missed. And uh, I'll be honest, that gave me chills when I, when I heard that. That gives you an idea. Because um, these guys look young, you know. Uh, Owen, I'll be honest. When you see the face and the neck tats and the facial, you kind of go, man, it's it just public perception. Well, some of those pictures of Angulo, he's like got Abercrombie collar on. He's with friends. He's young. They're all young, but it's like, you know, really? You did all this? But it said that he had started hanging around Latin Kings and 
you know, wanted to become a member, wanted to be part of that life, and they absolutely let him in, okay? So, I mean, you know, but you talk about that lifestyle and what happened, it, it just, you know, Kimberly Dyer had a relationship with Porter. She invited him over to Tyler Saunders' house, and it just... It's just horrible. You know, her body gets stuffed in a trash bin, this big plastic blue drum in a marshy area. And I guess, you know, it's 40 miles northeast in an area known as Constantine, Michigan. Okay. So Donald Owen gives the command. Mario Angulo is actually the one they said carried it out. But like I said, the pathologist said 83 wounds. You know, it was awful. They burned her. They beat her. They bound her. Her throat was slit. Um, it was It was absolutely awful. So. These guys get arrested. Now, interestingly enough, Donald Owen, he got picked up after like a high-speed police chase. So if you've seen those pictures, his nose is all messed up. Well, Kufelt, she's all beat up too. <laughs> I'm sure she's just tired of this guy. He leads him on a police chase after they try to serve a warrant. They pick them both up. Um, and now, now it's on, okay? So the three guys were, okay? Now, the three guys get picked up, Okay? At the time of the crime, Mario Angulo Jr. was only 19 years old. Matthew Marzinski is only 22 years old at the time, okay? And Donald Owen was only like 20, 21, okay? It's, it's you know, it, it, these guys were young. No, no, I'm sorry. Owen was 20 years old at the time. So what ends up happening is all three are scheduled to go to trial together a couple years after. So this is 2021, all right? Well, Matthew Marzinski flips, okay? He flips and turns on the other two, okay? He basically says, I'm going to plead guilty and I'm going to hope for less time. So he pleads out and in June of 2021, he gets 60 years for robbery resulting in serious injury and criminal confinement, all right? Well... That leaves Donald Owen Jr. and Mario Angulo Jr. They were tried and convicted jointly, okay? So at this point, Owen is 22. Angulo's, excuse me, he was 19 at the time of the crime. Now he's 21, 22. And Mrzinski was 22 at the crime. He was 25 when he got the 60 years. And I have, like in parentheses written here, he snitched, all right? Because, and this is how I know he did, an Elkhart County judge was sentenced Matthew Mrzinski to 60 years. He ordered that the Elkhart man be incarcerated for his own safety in a different prison from the other two men awaiting sentencing in the killing of 31-year-old Kimberly Dyer. So what ends up happening? Donald Owen Jr. is giving, <clears throat> excuse me, he is given life, no parole whatsoever. And Gulo Jr. gets 127 years. He appeals, comes out and says he was under duress, forced, all this stuff, yada, yada, yada. No, they uphold his his um, 127 year conviction of June of 2022. Um, you know, and all these charges were basically at the time, right, on that old Orchard Lane confinement resulting in serious bodily injury, and they so where I kind of realized in Indiana it's like a level three felony, level two felony, level one felony, and these guys, believe it or not, which I didn't feel bad for him at all. Robert Porter, they, they were charged for Robert Porter's beating and robbery. It was a robbery resulting in serious bodily injury, confinement resulting in serious, serious bodily injury. Um, he was from Sturgis, Michigan, Robert Porter was, all right? And he was 32 years old, so he's 10 years older than all of these guys. But, and, and again, I'll give you guys kind of an idea here. When you read news stories about murders or things that happen, uh, One way to tell if they're, and I hate to say it, but it's true. If they're not family, obviously. Like if you hear about a a really nasty car wreck at 2 a.m., right? Or a DUI car wreck. And there's three individuals. And you've, they're not family members, right? They're friends. And you've got ages ranging from 20, 40, and 60. I guarantee you, again, if they're not family, drugs are involved. That's how you can tell because a 32-year-old and a 20-year-old and a 31-year-old woman from all different walks of life and Latin Kings gang members and a, and a mo- single mom who's now dating this Hispanic guy, Lopez, and then this pot dealer and then, oh, Tyler Saunders owns this house. There's a common denominator that brings them together, guys, and it's drugs. 
it's always back to drugs. And I talk about this in, in all my videos. If you are struggling, get the help you need because things like this happen every single day. Maybe not to this extent, um, but, but this stuff absolutely happens. And uh, RIP to Kimberly Dyer. She was placed in a plastic bin and dumped in a marshy area. And I guarantee you when she woke up that day, she was struggling. And we talk about uh, hope. I don't think Kimberly Dyer at that point in life had a lot of hope. She was struggling with addiction, but she was young. And I, I don't like when I read things about, well, she was just a drug addict and a loser and wasn't taking care of her kids properly. No, that's wrong. That's so wrong. Everybody deserves hope. Everybody deserves chances. Um, as far as getting clean... I don't think after you brutally murder somebody, I don't think Donald Owen deserves a second chance. I'll be honest. I don't, even if you're 20, 21. That is a level of depravity that is rarely seen. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. This one really was pretty tough to make, but I really like bringing you guys these stories. And until next time.